All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for checking out today's Multiphonic A Day video. My name is Ben. I'm a bassoonist based in Chicago, and I've been making these videos every day that I'm inside during the COVID-19 pandemic. Today is Wednesday, April 15th, 2020. This is day 32 of my self-isolation, and today is episode 30 of Multiphonic A Day. Uh, I'm really excited today to have my good friend Ryan Little as a special guest. Uh, Ryan is the principal hornist of the Naples Philharmonic. He is a longtime friend and colleague of mine. We were at Rice at the same time and also played music together in the summer all over the place several summers. So Ryan, welcome to Multiphonic A Day. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me. Of course. I'm really excited about this. You know, this started kind of almost as a joke, but I'm, I think it's actually going to be a really interesting thing to talk about. Uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit funny to have a horn player on a uh, bassoon multiphonic series. Sure. But the impetus for this was that there have been two occasions in my life where I've been asked to give a contrabassoon read to a horn player for them to put onto their horn in place of a mouthpiece. Right. And the sonic result is pretty incredible. Um, so the, the, one of the times was with Ryan, and this was when we were playing Alireja Farhang's piece, Aptia, for bassoon, horn, and harp. And the very last gesture in that piece is actually the horn playing. It's notated with a bassoon reed. And we, I think we did some experimenting with a bassoon reed and found that the contra bassoon reed was the more effective choice. Right. Um, and I had gotten that in, idea in my head because earlier that summer, in Lisa Lim's opera, Tree of Codes, there's a place where the horn player is playing on a uh, contrabassoon read. So Ryan, do you wanna sh show your read and, and make some sounds on it? Sure, so um, this is a mint edition, Ben Royd Award <laughs> contrabassoon read. Oh, I, I didn't make it, I didn't make it, I wanna be clear. You didn't make this? No, oh. no, no. <laughs> Um, so it's been very interesting for me in this process, um, you know, a few summers ago when we uh, played that trio in Lucerne because I had never really buzzed on a, on a bassoon read, I think, before. I think I might have, buzz, uh, sorry, um, played on, on an oboe read when I was in school or something mm -hmm. as a kid, and I realized that it was really difficult and I never thought about it ever again. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, it's been really interesting to see how uh, I get that sound as a horn player who doesn't ever do something like this. Mm -hmm. um, and just to try and get the craziest sounds possible to just, you know, fill the room with something that no one has really ever heard. And I, I believe with the trio that we played, um, the harp strings are resonating with right. the sound of the horn with the contra read. And it's just out of this world. I mean, you never heard anything like it. So, um, you know, I've got my usual contra mm -hmm. sound and just so, be, before we go any further for all of the horn players out there who have never played on a contra bassoon read yeah. can you just kind of walk through the basics of your embouchure how you're placing it on yeah it? so <clears throat> I mean so first things first I mean I think a lot of horn players realize that our bassoon and oboe colleagues sitting in front of us uh, have to soak their read beforehand and same is true for this because I really noticed the difference Mm -hmm. um, you know, just trying to take it without soaking that reed first, it really makes it difficult. Um, but essentially, I'm just, you know, putting the reed between my lips, and then um, I'm really just trying to bring my lips together around the reed. And, uh, you know, as Ben and I have found out, like, we, there, the reed, where, where I um, have my pressure of my lips on, around the reed changes uh, the sound pretty significantly in the horn. So, you know, as a horn player, I was able to mess around and see even just that changes, you know, right. which is something I didn't know before. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. Let, let's, let's pop that sucker on there and, and just, just, yeah. So, you know, we found this out before that on the very edge of this contra reed, um, if you have, you know, this, I don't know what is this made of, Ben. This white part here. Oh, that's a, that's a shrink wrap, a plastic shrink wrap. So this shrink wrap, if it if it's all the way on there, it won't fit exactly in your lead pipe, most likely. But 
if you shave off the very end of that, you've got just the reed at the very end, and that actually fits in the lead pipe pretty much perfectly, which is kind of bizarre that that works so well. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you know, it goes in just fine. And then you've got both hands to just play the horn like you usually would. Um, and, you know, we were working on some things uh, earlier, but also, I mean, I just really try to make as much noise as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so. <laughs> Just a brief intro. That was a little less interesting than what we got earlier, but. Try, try some more, see if you can get some of those really complex multiphonics we were hearing earlier. So, um, just with no valves down at all, just going. So what we've found is that not only does the the pressure of your lips uh around the reed change that sound and the the variety of you know pitches and and noises that are coming out but also um where on the reed you're you know forming the embouchure affects mm -hmm. it pretty significantly as well yeah 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 this is a, a continuing theme in my in my videos that i've been trying to really explore different embouchure placements on, on, you know, different bassoon multiphonics. Sure. So can, can you kind of like, if you start way up near the first wire of the reed with some pretty firm embouchure pressure uh -huh. and then gradually migrate further off of the reed, can you just demonstrate what that sounds like? Sure. sure. So this is with, like you said, really firm pressure. And we got. <laughs> Oh, that, what was that low sound? That was amazing. Something interesting. I think I kind of gave in on the, the pressure there at the end, but um, mm -hmm. let me try that again. So. Yeah. So once I get towards the very edge of the reed, um, my lips are almost vibrating against each other while also forming an embouchure around the reed. So we're getting ah, all sorts of sounds. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And, and so when you're starting way up at the first wire, this is something that happens, you know, on, on bassoon multiphonics too, is that that tends to be the best place to isolate like a single harmonic. Uh -huh. Like it's getting one to speak because it's muffling the vibrations in a certain way. What if you use like pretty firm pressure, but in the middle of the reed? That's so good. And any time so that good. you heard uh, that sound change, I, I was realizing that was, you know, I was keeping the embouchure formed really just in the middle of the reed, like you said, but mm -hmm. any time that I started to relax the amount of pressure was, and that was the moment when you would hear the sound change pretty significantly. Mm -hmm. So e even just a small change in your embouchure pressure would cause a significant, yeah. Um, now, can you mess around with your valves a little bit? Sure. And show us what th what that does. So, like we were doing before, this is all just on the F harmonic series with no valves put down. So, um, if I start with that and then start adding some valves, we get. Ryan, you need to record an album. <laughs> so it seems like you know. On the horn, we've got these harmonic series because of, you know, the slides that we've got. So, mm -hmm. you know, the longer the slide, it seems like the, the more slides I put down because of the number of valves I put down, it seems like the lower the pitches I can, you know, produce on the, on the reed. Mm -hmm. And then... You know, if I yeah. play... Um, if I put down the trigger, which uh, goes on my horn to the, the B-flat side of the instrument, mm -hmm. those are where the shorter slides are, and then those higher notes seem to pop out without 
um, me really changing anything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and how about with your right hand, if you're, if you're experimenting with stopping the sound? So if I'm closing my hand all the way, it, I'll start with my hand open and with no valves down. And we'll mm -hmm. just get from... <laughs> Yeah. Can you do that one more time? Sure. So just because I just because I want to hear it again. <laughs> <laughs> so you really hear a difference because um, you know as I'm closing my hand, that you know that back pressure, all that air is coming right back up into the lead pipe and then mm -hmm. into the reed. So um, here's with the hand open and then slowly closing. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That, that is so good that, you know, that, that's, that is a sound that I never knew that I needed in my life. And then it's just like, you know, that. I feel like there, there have been movies where like maybe like an alien spaceship is landing on earth or something. And that's the noise that <laughs> I've heard in those moments. Like, yeah, it sounds so familiar, but I, I don't know why. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I, uh, what, what was it? I know there's I have this movie in my mind that it, that I'm thinking, but I can't remember. I can't. Re it'll it'll come to me. It'll come to me. Um, yeah, that's that's amazing. And you know, th this is funny too because the summer before we played this trio, we were in the orchestra for the Heinz Holliger Violin Concerto. Yeah. During which I borrowed your mouthpiece to put on the bassoon vocal. Right which was also an interesting thing. Maybe, well, I don't have a French horn mouthpiece. Um, maybe when all this is over. I'll I'll make have, a, uh, I, I have many that I can send you. Okay, okay, we'll talk, <laughs> we'll, talk. We'll, talk. We'll, we'll figure it out. You um, send me a contra read and I'll send you a horn mouthpiece. Yeah, I don't know if that's a fair trade, but um, I'll, <laughs> oh, yeah, give it, I'll give it back, I'll give it back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, is, is there anything else that, any other sh thoughts that you want to share about this uh, in terms of information that uh, horn players or composers would find useful about this kind of technique? Um, I think the thing for, for a lot of horn players, um, you know, new music is sometimes, I don't know, just difficult to get your heart into. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's for musicians, classical musicians in general, mm -hmm. but I think horn players, like we are so used to having all these, you know, really beautiful melodies and solos and, you know, the great classical romantic repertoire, all this stuff. Um, and, you know, you look at a piece like that and the very end is just, you know, this, these lines and it just mm -hmm. says, you know, use a controversy or use a right. Read. Right. Um, and, you know, I didn't exactly know what to make of that when I first looked at it, but, you know, I think um, in just trying different things, you know, you can change the, the atmosphere of an entire concert, just hmm. with that noise. Hmm. And it's because the composer asked for it and they must have had that in mind, you mm -hmm. know? And even though it was my first time um, experiencing that, that sound and, and also having to play it myself, I just tried to go 110% into the whole uh, experience. And, um, you know, obviously having a bassoon player in the trio is helpful. Helpful, you know, yeah, like yeah. Um, but really just experimenting with, you know, where on the reed um, and, and how much pressure and all that stuff and um, what valves to put down. And, you know, cause if you're trying to go from if you're trying to start on a really low note and go higher and come back mm -hmm. down all this stuff, you know, that's not necessarily something that we would know how to do with a bassoon reed in the horn lead pipe. So, um, you know, just kind of experimenting with it and using it as a laboratory and just figuring yeah. out what works and why it worked and how, and then trying to repeat it. Yeah. Know? Right. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily think that I got the same sounds in our rehearsals and our concert the same time. You know, I think the overall gesture, was going in the same direction every time, but mm -hmm. there might have been some multiphonics that were in there that, you know, and yeah. now that I'm thinking about it, I kind of wonder what it's like if I'm actually doing my horn multiphonics with the 
controversy and read. Ooh. Do you want to try that? Let's give it. A, let's give it a shot. So I'm just thinking about like. <laughs> Not not as interesting, actually. Yeah. So this um, is you you singing and playing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I find it's really interesting with singing and playing with multiphonic that a lot of the time, kind of what just happened to you happens to me is that it interferes with the vibrations in a certain way to emphasize one or two of the partials. And, you know, some of that is also like physically my embouchure is changing through me singing at the same time. Sure, so, sure. Um, but there, I think it can be a really effective technique. I just find it really hard to maintain the multiphonic and sing at the same time. Right. It's, it's something in this Bologna piece I'm working on right now. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for doing this. This was awesome. Yeah. Um, I might ask you to just like go hog wild to play us out. Sure. And, I just, um, needed to, just needed to dip that, dip that read again. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for watching, everybody. I'll be back tomorrow with some more multiphonics. And here's Ryan. Take it away. <laughs> <laughs>